and welcome to the very first Dividend Cafe of 2022. Those uh, watching on video can see that we have quite an elaborate setup because we have our partner in crime and investment committee member, Brian Seitel, joining us remotely. I'm sitting here in the studio with our deputy CIO, Dea Pernas, and I, of course, am here in the studio in Newport Beach as well. So we are bringing our first Dividend Cafe of the Year with the whole investment committee and something we intend to do a lot more of this year. Um, and, and to prove that commitment, we are starting the very uh, first podcast and video of the year off this way. And the subject is no less than our 2021 review and our 2022 perspectives. And I'm not going to lead uh, my colleagues through our entire white paper, lead you as listeners and viewers through it, but we're going to kind of hit some of the highlights of our key points and themes and perspectives of the year behind and the year ahead. Uh, but I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say that there is just absolutely no way that I can tolerate any of you watching this video as a substitute for reading the white paper or listening to the podcast as a substitute for reading the white paper. Um, we do that work and, and put a lot of charts and a lot of information and summary uh, type info uh, because we think it's very valuable. And we really do believe if you go to dividendcafe.com, print the whole white paper, there's a very uh, well designed and laid out kind of summary of the Bonson Group's collective work on the year behind and year ahead. And so please do pay some attention to that. You're welcome to share that PDF far and wide. And in the meantime, for your video and podcast purposes today, I'm going to bring in uh, Dea and Brian. So guys, I, I start off in the paper talking about the 2021 in review, and I say a sequential trip down memory lane. And rather than us go through the whole, what it, how many pages that what took? Is, that, was it about a 20 minute read or so? Is that, well, it depends how fast someone reads. So there are people that might take them like an hour. Uh -huh. And then there's some people that could read it in four minutes. Uh, yeah. About, I would say the average, yeah, about a 20 minute for the average straight through. human being straight through. Yeah, I not, not bet too it's bad. a little longer for really? the average. Okay. okay. Yeah. If they're like, you know, really absorbing. Yeah. yeah With the sure. charts and looking over yeah. all the info. It's good average, though. Like I said. What do you think, though, in terms of the sequential trip down memory lane, rather than go through the whole two pages of like all the market went through last year, the January stuff and the, you know, April or whatever. What for you, Brian, would be kind of the major event of 21, not thematically like which we're about to go through, but just kind of something from the calendar, like an event that happened in markets last year that sticks out as one of the major um, not even highlights or lowlights, just things that really stuck out for you in the way you remember last year. <clears throat> well, I mean, you know, I, I'm trying to remember actually a year ago when we did the 2020 white paper, um, heading into 2021, I, I think the things that stuck out to me were first off, uh, I think risk assets performed better than I thought they would have. Um, so pretty much across the board, uh, you know, stocks, bonds, alternatives, um, so there was an outperformance there. I think the supply chain issues were were more were no longer lasting and more substantial than I, I would have assumed. But we also haven't really dealt with a lot of these sort of global shutdowns before. So, um, I, you know, I think you know it makes sense that it would be, you know, something to surprise us. Um, you know, and then inflation. I think we Day and I were talking about it a little bit, but you know, inflation being something that was sort of topic du jour, um, where for the my most of my adult life, at least, it really hasn't been um, a couple of times here and there. Um, so, th I mean, as far as market impacts and things, I mean, those were some of the topics and things I thought were most relevant for 2021. Um, and then, you know, I mean, all the variants <laughs> that seemed to kept coming out of this thing, uh, the different night names of them and the different sort of, uh, you know, issues they caused and all that. So, you know, it, it, it was definitely a year and all in all, I mean, it ended up being a pretty good year for risk assets for markets. Uh, so, Dave, what about you? Um, not so much thematically, but just something from the actual kind of like flow of the year from the calendar, like an event or whatnot. Is there anything that you think was particularly memorable? So as far as not really thematically, just an event, uh, I it's hard for me to think of something event wise that was particularly uh, 
What if I give you some uh, options? Particularly surprising. Yeah, yeah. You okay, know, we had okay. the meme stock uh, escapades early in the year. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm. we, we, we had the vaccine uh, uh, uptake throughout the spring. And really, at one point, it looked like total eradication of COVID. You had Delta, which Brian brought up, that uh, cyber attack on the uh, and the pipeline and the hackers taking over the colonial pipeline. Yeah. Um, the Afghanistan withdrawal. You you had uh, obviously by end of the year the Omicron events. Mm. Um, there's one I'm gonna say that, I'll, but but I you know just from out 2021 since it's January yeah. six as we're recording. I'm hoping you haven't forgotten last year. No yet. no I I, uh, the, I I hope not. It's a great year. I hope uh, I hope it stays in my memory forever. Uh, uh, perform you know performance wise, but as far as those events go, I don't. I mean, even if you, when you when you uh, tell them to me, I, I I don't remember them sticking out that much. I mean, the meme stock, I just remember thinking it was ridiculous. Yeah, I cannot believe what some of those stocks are still trading at. I I, I was I was dead wrong in my prediction that, that they would uh, sink back down to uh, you know to 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 reasonable levels. Uh, but as far as, as anything stuck out event wise. I I don't know. I, nothing really just comes to my mind that's that that's that strong. Um, maybe I, I I don't know. Maybe market reaction a lot, around a lot of that stuff is is you know just the market continued to grind higher and higher and higher despite whatever event uh, seemed to happen. And uh, you know my 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 focus is more on uh, you know the asset prices really. But uh, but I'll, I'll I'll throw it back to you. What what do you think? Uh, well, what's, what's stuck out the most in your mind? But before I answer, I guess I'll say maybe one of the reasons is uh, that nothing is sticking out in, in a meaningful way is something we allude to in our key takeaways from the year number two is that if this is market volatility, sign me up. I point out it's basically tied, you know, for third as like the least volatile year in history. The, the total drawdowns were never at any point. There were six of them but they were really all kind of three or 4%. And, and I think that lends itself when you look at the year before, when we had a 35% drawdown in a month, those are kind of events that go into the history books. And 2019 was this year of the fed reversing course and assets rallying so hard. 2018 had a 20% drop in the fourth quarter. It had a trade war. It had fed tightening. Um, 2017 was this massive rally all year long, plus the first year of all the roller coaster of Trump. So we kind of had all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, 21, it seems like it would be a, no, a newsworthy year, but nothing is really grabbing any of us as like it was this huge thing. I mean, the, the meme uh, story sure. does it to me belongs in the in the comic books, not in the, the white paper. And yet it um, might've been one of the bigger stories of the year. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons that we just got through kind of such a low volatility year. Did it feel like a low volatility year to you, Brian? Absolutely. It's funny because in the, in the white paper, you talk about 17 and I, and I remember distinctly that year, you know, how there was really not <clears throat> any volatility at all. I felt it was the same. I know technically on paper, it was, I think we had a 5% drawdown or something. Um, versus For one day. Yeah, for one day versus a three. A day, yeah. Although we did, we did put money to work, uh, if you remember uh, back then, uh, quite a bit, if I recall correctly. Yeah. So we got that right. But um, but no, I think that you hit it on the head, which is the three of us. Uh, look, I'm I'm affected by a lot of things, but uh, I probably uh, get most affected by how much markets are moving at different periods of time, depending on which different reasons, because we have a lot of clients we care about. Um, and the fact that they didn't move all that much with all this sort of some of it nonsense, some of it, I guess, meaningful is probably why it doesn't really uh, didn't like, you know, engrave itself in my mind or anything like that. But, um, you know, so, yeah. Well, well, they had asked me like what mine was. And, and I think I'm even reinforcing the point of the non-eventfulness of the year by my answer being something. The biggest thing that happened in 2021 for me is something that didn't happen which was these long awaited tax and spending bills. Right. And I think it is one of the most profound stories. And I'm now wearing my CIO hat that as an investment professional, the amount of things that some people either did or wanted to do or, or thought about doing around an event that a never happened and B 
was never anywhere as close to happening as they believed it was is staggering. And yet, if you think about how many times, just in, even in the D.C. today, we were writing about Joe Manchin and reconciliation bill and infrastructure and build back better and, and the words White House and Biden and Congress and Manchin and cinema and this and that. They were it was there all the time. And it was the media story for months and months. And, and, and then you just by the holidays, they go, yeah, it's done. We're not going to do it. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I think that's incredible. I think it's absolutely incredible. It's very, very telling. And even, even late into last year, too, it, I think it was consensus that, at least on the investor side of things, there were going to be some changes tax-wise. Uh, you know, and, and and as you alluded to your white paper, you know, maybe the market didn't think so, but it certainly seemed that in all the conversations you were having with uh, politicos and whatnot, that 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 was going to be the case, and and nothing ended up happening. I, I think it's uh, it's something that's really worth remembering when people try to. Uh, make any sort of predictions when it comes to, you know, leg- what, what's going to happen legislatively speaking. Yeah, I, I think, uh, and, and you're right, and we dealt with a lot throughout the year, and I'm sensitive with this comment because I know that there are people that had did do some estate planning strategy changes based on some things that could come down the pike that may or may not. Um, I'd actually think those are still sound just because of the <clears throat> the cliff that's going to happen with a lot of the estate tax stuff in 2026. But aside from that, you know, all that stuff was was uh was shocking that it just came out to be a nothing burger really yeah and to the positive and i think markets actually the latter half of the year were were moving up part of the reason i think there was a little tailwind because i was taken off the table yeah it was kind of a it was kind of a, a weird symmetry because they didn't go down when those things were more likely supposedly and then they did go up when they became less likely and uh it doesn't really work that way, right? I, I, my argument, I, I remember saying this on, on Cuddler's show a couple times early mm-hmm. in 21. The market didn't ever seem to think it. And and in a way, the market, um, very similar to COVID, um, the market was a better understander of Joe Manchin than all these political analysts were. And the market mm-hmm. has most certainly been a better understander of COVID than, than Fauci, right? I mean, they're... I guess it's just yeah. interesting that uh, markets are not always great indicators when you get a lot of excess and markets are susceptible to black swan events as anything is when it's unseeable and unforeseeable. And yet in a couple of these things that involve the ability to discount probabilistic outcomes, the market did a pretty good job. Yeah. And I, I remember you, uh, your predictions around that even and you even though you were on the minority by saying that little to nothing was going to happen even you predicted there was going to be some slight changes uh, uh, absolutely and, and you were part of that minority on the other side of the spectrum yeah. you know and wow. uh, yeah yeah and that's right i still i i always believe that the biggest things people were freaking out about were not going to happen but i certainly thought something would end up getting done if nothing else, to kind of save face a little right right and there's kind of political reasons why that didn't happen i think there was a lot of misunderstanding but but you know where i really did change to even open up the idea that nothing would happen was after the virginia election and the way some things went in november mm-hmm. and you know we talked about this politically president biden's uh, approval ratings really started going down a lot in august and look it, if he had not wildly popular ratings like some of the ratings that President Obama had at certain points in time or that President Bush had after 9-11, if he just had kind of normal approval ratings, the political pressure to get something done would have been much stronger. And perhaps a Joe Manchin or a Kristen Cinema would have Kristen Cinema would have mm. given in. But I think that everything kind of came together in a way that just there was no reason to force anything to get done. Got it. Oh, so so your uh prediction as far as those uh tax rate changes towards the latter half of the year, uh it kind of fell off and by the fourth quarter by the fourth quarter you yeah. were you were you were going with nothing yeah yeah wow yeah it's hard it's hard for any sitting republican to go against a popular republican president and it's hard for any sitting democrat to go against a popular democrat president but apparently it wasn't so hard for a popular sitting moderate to go against a reasonably unpopular yeah. Par- pre- president of the same party and and so you know we'll see where those things go yeah. so brian you brought up uh the supply chain issues and that being a surprise to you that it lasted as long as it did um so let me ask you this i'm gonna start doing more with you and dea uh either or questions what's a bigger surprise either that prices did uh inflate the way they did 
or that bond yields didn't inflate the way they didn't? Good, good question. So, so what, what is more of a surprise? Um, Look, I mean, the, the, so as far as inflation goes and, and prices moving up partially because supply chain, um, I guess that's intuitive. That makes sense to me. Um, we hadn't sort of been through that, for, in my knowledge, in, in a long time. So I guess there was some surprise there just because it was something kind of new to digest. Um, but like you said earlier, like, you know, mar markets got it right. Markets do get it right most of the time. There's black swans that throw them off. But as far as the bond market saying that 10 years at 150 and rates are going to sort of say low like that, even with inflation numbers being so high, I think speaks to um, kind of, you know, you know, the market not really believing that the inflation number is number one going to be lasting. Uh, and number two, is it anything more than just a snapback from it going negative or down a whole lot the year before in 2020 and then sort of a recovery? And you, you sort of spoke about that or we have that in the white paper. Um, which I thought was fascinating as well. I guess a long answer to a to a short question is um, I was more supply, surprised on the supply chain side because it was a little bit more unknowable to me personally um, with my 20 year you know existence in this business. Um, whereas the bond market I've been analyzing for quite some time, and what I just what I see from that is that it isn't trusting those inflation numbers to be lasting. And I wrote about it a ton in DC today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, Dave, pretend. Um... We're not doing a look back on 2021 uh, and pretend you haven't read the white paper already. I'm sitting with you and it's January of 21. And I tell you, CPI is going to be up over 6% on the year. And that the only financial story that is going to be getting covered on left-wing media, right-wing media, financial media, is uh, just really shocking levels of price inflation. And um, the 10 years at 1.5%. What is the ten year going to end the year at, in your opinion? Um, I so and I, I and I'm glad you asked that because uh, and I think as you know, uh, portfolio managers and uh, you know investment professionals make decisions around where to allocate capital. Uh, you know, when it comes to markets, it's important to keep uh, in mind what your thinking was in stages of time. I think a lot of people may have trouble as reality kind of. Uh, transpires uh, and they're you know they they lose sight of previous memories uh but i remember very clearly uh not thinking that there was was going to be too much movement when it came to and i'm gonna, as far as the bond market i'm just going to say the 10 year uh primarily given the amount of uh fed manipulation i mean even if there were market forces that were going to cause it to rise, which I didn't think they were, given uh, just the amount of uh, debt in our system in general and how difficult it is for uh, a long-term growth. Uh, but I just thought the Fed, Fed was going to do whatever it could to keep that uh, that that part of the, the curve down. Uh, but as far as uh, as far as the demand side of things, as far as the CPI numbers, uh, and I know you know we're uh, for some of those months we're coming off a uh, maybe a lowish base in 2020. I am I am shocked to see some of the just how just the surge in demand and how sustained it was really. Uh, uh, I mean, just inventory levels across the board on everything were uh, were just absolutely compressed. You got wages, uh, the, the the market for used cars, uh, the market for luxury. I mean, every every everything any sort of market you look at, uh, uh, you know, inventory dried up. And a lot of people, uh, you know, obviously there's some su supply concerns there, supply shocks, but really is, uh, you know, is the fact that there's a huge demand story and uh, that kind of demand surge. To me, there's no way I would have been able to predict that level, but, uh, but you know, maybe somebody else has a different opinion. Um, so, Brian, let me ask you, if I tell you the same thing, it's January 21 and I say CPI is going to be up over six um, and the Fed is going to have to start talking about tapering and there's all this political pressure on inflation. Um, and uh, I tell you that gold is at um, $1,900 an ounce, $1,850 an ounce. What do you tell me gold is going to end the year at? Um, well, if, if uh, in, in, <laughs> as far as gold goes, I mean, we, we, have, we have it in the white paper too. Um, you know, it didn't do uh, what most people think it does, which is an inflation hedge. Well, I'm but I'm asking, what would you have predicted a year ago in those circumstances? If, if, if I told you those 
set of variables were going to play out, what would you have thought gold would have done? If inflation was going to be higher than we expected, was your question? Or, or I, way higher than expected, yeah. way higher than- I would, I I would mean, expected gold to be a little bit higher. You know, I mean, I, I would have expected that it would have gone up a little bit if we were expecting a higher inflationary period of time, but not meaningfully and, and not necessarily directly correlated, you know, which is what my career has taught me with the price of gold, which is that it isn't necessarily an, an inflation correlation hedge. And so the idea that gold was down 5% on the year, that the dollar was up 5% on the year, and that the 10 year bond yield didn't move at all on the year, these things uh, become very uh, complicated circumstances for, for a lot of people to have to process, I think. They're always moving targets, you know, and, and uh, if you're trying to predict a one year move in interest rates based on the facts that you know at the beginning of the year, or one move year in, in something like a precious metal, or one year one year move in something like that based on everything that you know on January 1, markets are too fluid and things change. Um, correlations are there, but they're not perfectly correlated. And so those things can change as time goes on as well, which, you know, it's what makes what we do so so fun and fascinating, right? We get to learn learn something new every day. Um, I, I, you know, we, but the reality is that the reason, and the way we mitigate it, like some of some of that risk and phenomena going on, is is through the asset allocation that we build in the portfolios that we manage, and so we can sort of, you know, you know, zig when other things zag, I guess, along along the year. Well, I w- I want to move us out of twenty twenty one, and so just real quickly for listeners, um, the five key takeaways we had from the historical year that we've been sort of discussing. Uh, was the price inflation in, in the bond market. We talked about if this is market volatility, sign me up, an incredibly um, friendly year in terms of downside volatility. The third theme is that not everything came out unscathed. Um, it's something we've already seen in the very early days of 2022. A lot of the very shiny object things, uh, hot tech companies, smaller cap growth companies, Certain areas of the market came way off of their mid-year highs, um, and that, I think, is a really underappreciated fact of the year. We talked about the national tax policy story ending up uh, very different than people expected. And then the fifth theme that we won't get into right now in the podcast, but uh, that we write about in the white paper, is a nation changing its mind on work. I think both Dan and Brian made comments on the uh, supply chain that really have to also incorporate uh, intersection with labor shortages, that it became very connected um, to a declining labor participation force. And there's a lot um, that remains uh, important in both the culture and the economy around labor conditions. So let me let me move us into 2022. One thing that the white paper does is give the themes that we had a year ago in 2021 and provide a little report card. You know, if I said one of the themes was don't fight the Fed, how did that theme play out? If I said the M&A train is coming, how did that theme play out? And I'll let you read that in the white paper because I don't want to take all the time. There were eight different themes. I do think it was one of the better years of macro forecast that we, there were some that we got uh, almost creepily and profoundly right. I completely agree. It's one of, yeah, one of the best. Yeah, since I've, you know that as far as forecasting goes, is there, there's there's really, there's usually really good. there's usually one where it's really really wrong, and there weren't really any I thought were really yeah. wrong. There were some that were kind of quasi right. You know, so all the people read it on their own and, yeah. and interpret how they would get, how they would score us if they were our teacher. But now we're going to put ourselves out there again. And in a year from now, we'll be having to face another report card. But our themes for 2022, I'm just going to say it. I'll let you guys kind of add to it or push back or, or you know, play around with the theme. Uh, number one is just that equity returns are highly unlikely to be what they've been. And, you know, when you're coming off of a year that, um, you know, our dividend portfolio is up uh, nearly 30 percent and the S&P is up 27 percent and the Dow is up 18 percent. This is a pretty, and not to mention really strong returns in 2020, 2019 in equities. Uh, it's not that hard of a forecast, but I think we're saying a little more than just instead of 20%, you're going to get 10%. I think I am suggesting 
that there's real vulnerability for certain parts of the market. And the only reason why I'm content to let people say, hey, you're not being that specific, how much will it go down or what will go down? I'm not doing that because I say all the time that I can't do it. So why would I pretend to do something I can't do? But I do believe what we can do and where there is some legitimacy in the application of this theme is that investor expectations ought to be different. And by the way, there's a really big risk if we were wrong here. Like what if you had another 25% year in the S&P? What does that mean the market multiple would be going into next year? I mean, to me, that would mean you're talking about blow off top. And then on, right now, my view is there's a lot of things that are going to get the heck beat out of them. I think if you have a 25% S&P again, then you're going to have everything get clobbered, everything. And, and, and I, I'm not convinced of that right now. I think right now we're in a period that it's still Darwinian and there's still the possibility of rotations as opposed to risk off. But if you have another year like this year, then you just simply have a market multiple across the board that's insane and very dangerous. So let you guys kind of offer your own commentary around that theme. Equity returns unlikely to be at the same level they've been. I'll start with you, Brian, and then go to Dan. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely share the sentiment and, and the thesis, which is that, um, you know, intuitively it makes sense. Last year was, was a, a great year and we had great earnings growth last year. Huge. Coming off of a very low of 2020, it, you know, can, you know, and I don't want to jump themes because I know that I know what the other ones are. But um, as far as the S&P being up another 25 percent, look, I, I, I would agree. It's, it's not what I want. It's not what I want with no volatility. It's not what I want because it basically means that the, the prices are fully distorted at that point. So if earnings come in in the 2023 level, the S&P 500 and the markets are up 25 percent, you're going to have a multiple. At, David's better at math than me, but something like what, 25 or 30 times earnings, something like that. <clears throat> so no, I don't want that. So I, th I think it is more realistic to, to, uh, to assume a lower level of return. Um, do I think they'll be negative? Look, I, it's hard to predict a one-year period of time precisely. What I can say, though, and, and, and I'll add to this from the white paper a little bit or, or add to the white paper, um, is the, the idea of there is no alternative, right? I mean, so, so we have, yeah, equities are, are a little stretched. They're at 21.5 times earnings, but that's including, you know, a lot of, a lot of tech names that are at much higher multiples. When you look at some other sectors um, that I think will drive those sort of positive returns in the S&P. So you, I think you'll get more, a little bit more of tail wagging the dog, where the, where the big part was all these huge tech companies. I think those will underperform, um, and then I think you'll get some of the more value, more some of the more cyclical names that are trading at 15, 16 times earnings, maybe moving those valuations up a little bit. Um, and as those earnings come in, um, that's where I think you'll get positive performance. But but I wouldn't throw the market out for 2022 just because let's look around the globe for a second and think about where opportunity lies. There's still opportunity in markets. Um, you just have to be very selective, very actively managed, um, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so th th those would be some of the things I would build on upon that theme. Dan? Yeah, I mean, I think Brian's answer is pretty comprehensive, uh, and I agree with everything he said. It's hard to add to that. Uh, all I would really say as far as, I mean, uh, I, I, don't understand, I don't see a scenario where we do get the same earnings growth as we did in uh, 2021. Uh, 40, 45%, you know, <laughs> I, I'm sure that, uh, you know, it's a very high level of prognostication ability there. Okay. But that, but uh, obviously but, we're not going to get that. So we'll yeah, yeah. ask you this though. Will we're, we're we get, not, will we get higher than expected earnings growth? But I would just real quick, I would say if we did get 45%, <laughs> yeah, if we growth, did, I, I, then I would be perfectly happy with another 25% move up in the s and <laughs> Well, yeah, if you got 45% uh, earnings growth again, you, your multiple would be back to, to par. Yeah. yeah. You'd yeah, be at about so. a 16X. But, yeah. but but the key is not obviously the same earnings growth on your point there. Right now, consensus is about 8 or 9% earnings growth, and that's at a 22 times. So, so to get 8% uh, earnings growth to move the markets, you're going to have to get multiple expansion. So basically, to get kind of mid-single digits, maybe high single digits, mm. you're going to have to get some outperformance of earnings expectation. Do you think you could get 11, 12, 13% earnings growth? Uh, I think the, if I had to bet on whether uh, earnings would outperform uh, expectations, I would 
I would take that bet simply because I think the the the, the surge in demand that we're seeing, I think, uh, continues. I mean, but but then that, that's not a it's not something I have a huge degree of confidence in. It's like you know that's what I think may happen, but it, it's difficult to say for certain. Now, obviously, there's the cost side of the equation as well. There's significant significant wage pressures. There's commodity pressures. Uh, I don't know how all this will uh, translate uh, into, uh, you know, as far as net income growth, but uh, but it'll be it'll be uh, fun to see. Can can you guys just yes or no? Because I want to move on. But yes or no? Can you see a scenario where earnings growth outperform, but the market is down? Sure. Yes. Yeah. That's the thing that I think is out there. That um, it's baked in. You get eight or nine, and if you get ten or eleven, it may not be enough because of where multiples are. So then, then you have to kind of get like 13, 14, and then you're going to need margin expansion and you're going to need this pent up demand to, to persist. And you're going to need top line revenue growth. It, 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 all of those things are possible. It's just that you need all of them. Mm. You need, you, you, you really are lined up where nothing can go wrong in order to get that index like return. And I think from a risk reward trade-off, it's the most unattractive it's been for a long time for me. Um, the other things that have hurt markets over a year were never in this projectable, analyzable, discernible framework. They were black swans. It was COVID and it was financial crisis and it was 9-11 and it was Greece and it was Europe and it was uh, geopolitical. It was China. I'm not talking about anything event driven here. I'm just saying, let's assume a normal world. That's supposed to be a great investing environment, a little bit of peace, a little bit of prosperity. If you get 9% earnings growth, you can have markets down 5% because you're at 22 times already, right? So I think you were, that's the issue where I'm going to skip mm. for a moment to number six, which was another theme about, excuse me, to number five, that this is values year. I think that even if all those things did line up, it ends up being a decent year for index investors. I think that's the very best case scenario is it ends up being decent. What about any sort of events that could be a catalyst to the upside for equities? Well, the, see, there's <laughs> uh, we know various potential downside catalysts. So sure, what are sure. upside catalysts to equities? Like, what if they come up with a vaccine? Okay, done that. <laughs> what if Omicron rips through and then there's even more herd immunity? Okay, well, that's happened. What if they don't end up passing big tax cuts or tax increases people are worried about? That's happened. Yeah. You could say, what if the Republicans are more tax and regulation friendly and they take back the House? Tell me one market actor that doesn't already believe that's going to happen. So I don't know any upside catalysts that but, are not priced in. What about in. the Fed? Um, yeah, I mean, the Fed cuts the Fed funds rate from zero to zero. <laughs> Maybe delays I mean, that would, a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the Fed doing something unforeseen like that, going the other way, more dovish, I think would move value. But wouldn't you argue move. that that could also be more unexpected dovishness, Brian? It could be bearish because then people have to say, what the hell is wrong in our well, economy it, it that's making them do this? I agree. I mean, th these are these are sort of uh, just hypothetical. It would only be in a vacuum of not that much bearish reason for them and them acting in, in a perceived way from markets and, you know, that would be, un, you know, they didn't have to be so devish, but they decided to anyways, type of a thing. I mean, may, maybe we, we, maybe we fill the 10 million job openings. Maybe people want to go back to work. Maybe baby boomers stop retiring and, and, and they come back to work. You know, I mean, all of these things, most likely none of them will happen, but um, I guess those could be some positive catalysts for stocks. That then, and in that case, would that push PE or would it push E? I think it would push E, but E would be, it'd be future E. Um, but again, yeah. though, it's, it's what you alluded to. And again, not to jump themes, but when we say the market's having some tailwind here because of valuation, that's completely true. And we're all on the, we're on the same page. But then, but then we sort of, what we're really telling you is that don't own the whole market, you know, right? I mean, I, I, you know, I don't think you should at this point. If you did in 2021, it worked out just fine. Um, it did in 2020, frankly. Um, but I really do think now more than ever that it's going to be an important time to be selective in this market because there are parts of it that not only are overvalued, some of it grossly overvalued, but there's just not a lot of unforeseen tailwinds that we can even think of right now to keep the valuations moving the way they are. And so being selective, I think, and, and uh, 
and what part of the market that you own is going to be more important in 2022 than it has been. And, and I have said that I'll, I'll speak my book. I've said that before. Um, and, uh, and I'll say it again, that's okay. But, um, but I do think that's an important theme for 22. But I think us having said it before has to be contextualized uh, just because index investing did well in a year that we point out uh, a kind of concern in the risk reward trade-off. Uh, all I'm doing right now is same thing you're saying is, is giving the updated math. If uh, you think you're going to get earnings growth of 5% in a given year, and that's consensus expectation, and you're trading it 18 times, you can point out and be right, hey, this looks like it's a better year to be selective because earnings uh, growth is not looking like it's going to be very big and you're already at above market multiple. Now all I'm doing is saying, look, they're already baking in 8 to 9% earnings growth. And you could say, well, maybe it's going to be a lot more, but we already just got 45% earnings growth. So how much more do you really think it'll be? And 22 times starting point. So just to do the math of what it takes to get to a 5,300 S&P, which first of all, if we got it, that's still only a low teen percent return. It's good. That's real good. But just to get half of what you got this year, you have to have another multiple expansion and outperformance on earnings. I'm not saying it can't happen. Yeah. I'm just saying that your point in the past, Brian, it's even more true now than it's been. Yeah, that the trade, the risk reward trade off is unattractive. Yeah, and, and I'll end it with, or at least in my section on, with this. Daya was, I like what Daya said on the demand side because I, when I, when I do think about what what could happen to the positive side that 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 could change the earnings picture, it is demand. It's it's that the that we're still in this lull and the demand ends up being you know twice as much or or far more than we would have you know than we would have thought, and that flows into the E in the earnings equation. So. Um, you know, there, there's that that could drive it a little higher too. But either way, I still don't think it's a. We're not getting a 2021 year. I don't. You know, I don't think yeah. it's going to be something positive, but something pretty benign. And so I guess let's transition that to our our fifth theme of this year is uh, this is values year, and this is where I think one can have some market bullishness and still be consistent and compatible with what we all have just been saying. Uh, it's in, this is a very much a kind of 2000 and 2001. And I should be careful, a 2001 pre 9 11 thesis where you can have an index kind of blow up and you can have certain parts of the market kind of blow up and you can have some entire major segments of the market still do real well. And that's actually a more common thing, what we call rotation. Generally, rotation is a more common outcome out of a great market than a just plain sell off. But we're so used to event-driven sell-offs around the last 20 years of investing with financial crisis and European and geopolitical and COVID and other things. I feel like this is a very logical possibility that we get a um, compression of the delta, a reversion to the mean of the relationship between the so-called growth parts of the market and the so-called value parts of the market. And even though this isn't directly correlated to our world of dividend growth, again, working uh, on evidence-based assumptions and probabilistic um, investing, I see value doing well and growth not doing well as more likely than growth doing very, very well. Your thoughts? Uh, yeah. No, I. It, it's funny because I... A lot, you know, like you and Brian were just talking about is I felt that for quite some time. <laughs> I do think now it's, it's, uh, I'm more convicted in that than ever. Uh, I, I feel the same way. It's just, it, it's just something. And it, I thought the part you said, it was interesting as far as, uh, we're so used to event driven sell-offs and really when there's more of a garden variety end of cycle type of rotation, you know, this is something we should see. And now it's time to kind of, you know, try to load up on some of these names that have attractive valuations. By uh, the way, if, if today were December 31, 2022, then we saw it. Because yeah. in, the first, in the first four days <laughs> right. of this year, then right. that's what we've sort of seen. But of course, Let, let's Mike, let's annualize that. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. been a great year for energy. It's right, up right, a right. trillion percent. Yeah. Or um, in the beginning of 2021, where you started to see that rotation uh, pretty yeah. sizably. And, you know, and then, 
and that and that's and that's something we talked about in the white paper it did look like it was going to happen but i candidly admit it didn't but see the difference is large value was up 25 last year large growth was just up 28 yeah however i want to ask you this dea large excuse me small cap value was up 28 and small cap growth was barely even on the year it was actually down going into late december it had a little rally the last couple weeks is this small cap um, distinction where value hugely outperformed growth, is that foreshadowing for large cap value growth? I, I, I mean, it's, it, I, I don't think so. I think, I think the large cap growth names that have captured the hearts and minds of the American public are, uh, are special in the sense that they're completely in their own kind of uh, class uh, you know, and valuations on that side of things, I, I don't think matter to a lot of those investors. Uh, but yeah, the, but we but we know they don't matter now. I'm asking, will they matter in a month or I, in a year? I, I I think so. I think they will. I think they will. Uh, you know, but you know, I've thought I've thought that before. But I, I do believe that as as more time goes on, it makes it more and more likely that uh, we'll happen to be right on this particular topic. <laughs> and and by the way, for listeners and viewers, I am. Um, uh, actually make a joke about what Dea's, Dea's point is that we, uh, Brian's in the same boat. I'm most definitely in the same boat. Like Dea, we thought this was going to happen before and it hasn't. I've always been very humble about the fact that I, I am never certain when something going to happen, but that's why I use the word probabilistic a lot is that we have to allow for risk reward trade-offs, not making hard and fast timing predictions. But the analogy I use in the white paper is joking about playing basketball with friends and saying, Oh, I'll bet you 20 bucks. I make this shot. And then you miss it and you go double or nothing, double or nothing. And, you know, you keep doing it. Eventually you make one, you're not going to have to pay out. And that's sort of the joke. I feel like with this is if you say it long enough, eventually value outperforms growth, Mm -hmm. but I don't think we're merely saying, Brian, Hey, value is going to be growth this year. Okay. I'm saying that there is going to be a secular period where there is a mean reversion that uh, value and growth long-term investment record comes back to a historical relationship with that we will require a very sizable and extended length of time of value outperforming growth. Do you believe I'm right? I do believe that, that you're right. Uh, very much, very much so. I mean, you know, getting a secular uh, shift in, in markets, a secular shift in, in, in change like that is, is not easy to do. Um, because secular is inherently meaning this is a secular period of time. It's a longer period of time. When we're talking about the two things of rotation from growth to value, um, you know, that can most often is, is relatable to, to a business cycle. You know, you get growth outperforming in the beginning and, and value outperforming in the end of it. I don't consider us being necessarily at the end of a business cycle here, but I do think we're no longer in the first inning since they're going to start hiking rates next year. And that technically usually starts the middle of the end of the, of the business cycle. So you've you've had you'd had you'd have some um, wind in your backs from a rotation perspective, from a, from a uh, business cycle perspective. Then you would also have wind at your back just from a secular perspective that growth hasn't outperformed value this much basically ever since the year two thousand, and we sort of remember how that all played out. The last thing I'll say before I dig up all the time, real quick, is when you said the small cap growth and small cap value is that an indicator of of what can happen with the large side? I would I would. I would say this, um, it could be in the sense that, remember, small cap growth valuations were probably double that of large cap growth valuations. And I think the relative outperformance on the other side, on the value side, on the small, on the small cap side, is showing you that valuations do matter. And I think you're, you're starting to see that in 2022 already. I mean, it's only been a week, but um, that you're getting that outperformance in, in lower uh, relative value names than, than higher relative value names. So those would be kind of the couple of things, you know. Um, on that. Well, um, we, we have a few themes that I'll, that I'll do all at once or, or kind of bring together because there's a relationship in the topics between the Fed and inflation and housing and bond yields. But, but um, let me ask you, because you're on that theme, Brian, do you believe um, that the Fed, well, our, our second theme is that a lot of people are worried about something they shouldn't be with the Fed. And they're not worried about something they should be. 
And what I mean by that is I couldn't care less if they raise rates three times. And I certainly couldn't care less if they taper their ridiculous QE. And so there's all this hand wringing over a little bit of tightening in this excessive, excessive, excessive accommodated, easy environment. I pointed out in uh, the DC Today um, what by now people listening to it was yesterday, but the market has been up basically every time that they've raised rates six months later at an average six month return of over 8%. I don't care about that. It needs to happen. However, what I do think people aren't worried about is the sustained malinvestment and um, lack of price discovery and uh, distortion in the markets that the excessive liquidity and, and, and mispricing that has taken place around heavy monetary accommodation. Um, I guess I'm wondering, do you, do you think I'm being too sanguine about tightening and do you think I'm overreacting to uh, Fed distortion? Um, I'd say no to both of those questions. Um, you know, it's hard. You know, as far as being too sanguine, um, you know, we'll, we'll have to see. But I share this. I share the sentiment, which is going from zero over the period of a year and a half to for to one and a half, or or maybe two percent on Fed funds before that's terminal on Fed funds rate. Um, do I think that is something that is going to overturn the the markets? I don't. I think you'll have some. Edwin and maybe some bond markets on the shorter end as they do that. Um, and, and, you know, we speak about it in the white paper, but, you know, they also have a $9 trillion balance sheet where I really do think they're going to take their time with raising rates and just do a combination of a rate hike. It, that, that, by the way, I'm saying this all, all after QE ends. So QE ends in April, <clears throat> then they can do a combination of a rate hike in July and September. Then maybe you get some balance sheet reduction or just stop reinvestment in interest and dividends. And then you get another rate hike. And so they, I don't think it's in the Fed's best interest to get to terminal Fed funds rate, in other words, in like 18 months. I think what they want to try to do is do it over the course of a couple of years. And so in that environment, does that make me lose sleep on, on equities or, or fixed income or alternatives or even real estate in some ways? It doesn't. Um, to, and I'll, I'll stop with this. To your other point on what's the real story with the Fed, it's that they've become the buyer of everything of last resort. And so this isn't in the white paper, but what I would say is if there is something that keeps me up at night, is since markets are now dependent on, on, on that, um, let's just hope they can keep being the buyer big enough to be that buyer of last resort, because that's what the, the position that they put themselves in. Um, so. Okay, so Dave, uh, to, to <laughs> Brian's point there, um, do you believe that uh, he's saying, look, that getting the terminal Fed funds rate over a couple of years and and that terminal rate itself is still going to result in a negative real rate. I mean, even if they get on their dot plot out to two, two and a half percent, they're still talking about being at zero or negative uh, 50 basis points in real rate. Mm. And to Brian's point, that taking a couple of years. So I guess I'm wondering, what is your expectation from the Fed are they it, our entire adult lives? And I'm older than you, so it's not just yours, but mine as well. The Fed has been an accommodator, a cuddler, an enabler of risk taking. To me, the thing that has to really, um, and Brian brought this up by alluding to the idea of them not being a buyer of last resort. The thing that has to paradigmatically scare investors is if all of a sudden the Fed changes uniform, we mm. are no longer there to really be an enabler of risk assets. Wow. Do you think that's actually on the table? I do not. But if that were to happen, I, I mean, the repricing that you would see in risk assets would be one for the ages. Um, I, 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 it's hard for me to, uh, to consider a case, especially in an environment where, you know, the Fed and the Treasury are so closely linked uh, and even more so than they have in the past. Uh, where uh, the, the the Fed can act completely independent of just the, the broader society and and the nannying and coddling that's been going on, uh, as David mentioned, I don't see that ever happening. Uh, you know, so I, I do think that you know everything that that Brian and David mentioned as far as the terminal rate being uh, low and has been in the past, and that, that taking over a couple of years. Uh, I you know I don't the cost of money will go up a little bit, but not as much as it as it should not as much as market forces would dictate. 
and I still think it's going to be fine for risk assets. If anything, it might, it might help our our rotation thesis, uh, having the cost of money go up a little bit. Maybe, maybe that'll be the trigger. Uh, it would. I mean, if you can actually get um, the long end of the curve higher, right. that's one of the problems. Is people say, oh, well, the Fed has been holding the long end of the curve down. But the problem is then the Fed leaves the market and the long end of the curve doesn't go higher. Right. Exactly. But if you were to get uh, a wider spread in the yield curve, I think it would be advantageous to our value rotation thesis. Um, there's a great chart, uh, by the way, I would love all of you to check out in the white paper, page 16, um, going back uh, to me leaving high school. Okay, so we're talking about 30 years ago. Um, the amount of predictions from analysts about bond yields and then the uh, actual line of the bond yield itself. And you see that time and time and time and time again, that there is the um, propensity to expect bond yields to go higher than they do. And that the actual versus the forecast is a 30 year long story of the actual being different than the forecast, meaning the forecast being for higher and the actual being lower. Interesting. But yeah. since we're talking about inflation expectations and we're talking about the Fed, um, the eighth theme that we have for 2022 is that bond yields will be higher, just not that much higher. And I wonder, Brian, if you think that I'm onto something, will we think. see a 10 year higher by the end of the year, but not that high? I, I completely agree with that. And, and I'll explain. First off, the chart that you have in the white paper is really neat to look at. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons why, but but not to get off topic on that. But as far as bond yields being a little, but being higher, because they're going to raise rates a little bit and and, and and maybe, you know, they're not purchasing assets and that causes rates to move a little bit. Okay, fine. But just think about this. So, so they're raising rates and they're not purchasing assets. Is that stimulative for growth or is it constrictive for growth? It's constrictive. Do, do long-term yields te te technically go up when there's less growth or down? They go down. So I think, I think sometimes it's counterintuitive and people think about rates and you think about what they're doing is to try to help the economy get off of life support and be able to function on its own, in which case they're going to raise rates along the way to do that. Um, so, so yeah, th that will cause rates to go up a little bit. But then there's sort of the tug of war between that and also uh, as they do that, they are, they are taking maybe a little steam out of the market while they do that. And so rates tend to be a little subdued to that. And then also the simple just demographic and, and structural phenomenon of, of a, glo a globe that is over indebted, uh, uh, all of those things causing low rates to happen. So, so yes, I think you're spot on with it. Absolutely. Uh, Dea, your comments on 2022 expectations, not just bond yields, Brian kind of covered that, yep, but inflation, Fed, um, what do you, do you think 2022 has anything to surprise people with these categories we're talking about that are all sort of related to one another? You know, it's funny, uh, and I changed my mind on this after reading your uh, white paper, actually, given that I did think that inflation was going to continue to be a story, uh, but I didn't think, uh, you know, the headline numbers are going to read as high as uh, they did in 2021. And because there was going to be that disinflation, I think that uh, the Fed could very easily uh, just couch it in a way that, look, we have inflation, but it's less than last year. And so, you know, we don't need everything's fine guys, uh, you, you can all go back to work. Um, so uh, I don't see the inflation thing being a, a, a big story for that particular reason, because it is- Which is different than you saying there would be a good thing. You're just saying it, you're agreeing on my thesis that it will get couched that way. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's it, well, 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 let's take it to the other, other side of things. So like if inflation was somehow higher than it was in 2021, then it might become a problem and it might cause the Fed to take some sort of hawkish stance which could really spook markets. But because uh, the, the headline numbers are so high last year, it's likely that those uh, those inflation numbers come in significantly lower, even though they're still high relative to his, uh, historical standards. But it, the, it, it's couched in a way that where the FUD, or the Fed, excuse me, can continue to, stay, uh, to, to be very dovish. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I, th I thought that was a, a very insightful point. Uh, but as far as, uh, and what was the other part of your question? Anything else is going to happen in 2022? Yeah, just any of the surprises you're expecting. Um, Because uh, <laughs> uh, it wouldn't I be a surprise if you were expecting it, but right, maybe exactly. it would be a surprise to somebody else. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe it would, you, we didn't talk about U.S.-China 
relations at all. Maybe it would be a great surprise if somehow the U.S. and China had some sort of reconciliation. Um, I think that could be really helpful for markets. I, I would uh, love reconciliation. To see- or I, I mean, some sort of improvement in their uh, Just relationship. Communist with, and Democrats getting together and hugging it out. Well, I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> like like how maybe how U.S. and China were pre-Trump. Uh, okay. if we we go back to that type. Of, so uh, yeah, okay. So dynamic. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, and and frankly, that was a pretty civil relationship. It, right. Exactly. Um, but you would admit that's a really unlikely tail re- event. I, I I I would think it would be very very unlikely given uh, just the, the current zeitgeist, uh, U.S. and China for that matter. Uh, when when uh, Brian and I were at Morgan Stanley, uh, their chief economist at Morgan was a guy named David Darst. It was really really funny guy, smart guy. <laughs> I remember him saying one year in like 2011 that his most bullish upside. Surprise catalyst would be a picture getting out of Nancy Pelosi and John Boehner in a bathtub together, drinking champagne. <laughs> and, and so, all of it, you know, cause the Democrats and Republicans were fighting so viciously at the time and the, uh, the partisanship and it was hurting the ability to get certain things done. And he was saying, what if it, you know, there was this kumbaya, I was being funny about sure. it. And, and so that's day as uh, 2022 yeah. upside, upside surprise, surprise is uh <laughs> president G and the powers that be in the beltway uh uh coming back around yeah. brian any upside surprise you want to you want to um throw out there before i take us home <clears throat> sure I, i'll give you three quick ones um how about one first, quick one a, a first upside well i was gonna make a joke with the super who would be in the super bowl but i'll put that aside then for a second <laughs> um a, a upside surprise uh uh it would be it's chargers was the answer um the, the upside brian, surprise can we, I, are they gonna make the playoffs. This Sunday's game will determine determine that, and I think no, it's they, a several Sunday games, right? They need to help. No, I think they 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 beat the Raiders, and I'm pretty sure they're in. But um, now look, ups, upside would be um, on the demand side for me. So so okay. a 2022 upside surprise could be that the demand picture, while it was robust in 21, is continuing and and maybe even builds upon that into 2022 with pent up demand, with things reopening. Um, and those types of things. The last thing I would say an upside surprise is if we don't have to wear masks on plane anymore because this uh, this variant and, and everything tends to kind of run its full course and we can kind of move on with life. So I like that one. Yeah, uh, I'm with you on that. Uh, much more likely that by the end of the year, we're not wearing a mask on a plane that the Chargers win the Super Bowl. <laughs> um, I'm going to take us home. I'm going to land this plane to uh, to play off of our theme there. Uh, Just by reading from the very last paragraph of this year's white paper, it has not been a good period of investing for the pathological pessimist. I have the rare burden of believing there are structural concerns of significance in our world and our economy, central bank distortions, cultural shifts around work, governmental size, geopolitical apathy about the international order, all kinds of things that, that Brian Day and I have talked about here today. And yet also being an unrelenting optimist. Betting against humanity has been a losing bet for a long time. And regardless of what 2022 produces, I remain optimistic about the future for investors who are exposed to the ingenuity of mankind, the greatest investors of the last few decades, and I believe the next few decades, will be able to hold these two realities in tension with wisdom and humility, that there are concerning things in the world even as there is investable opportunity in human action. So as for anything that uh, Brian Day and I got wrong in this discussion, um, anything that is wrong in the white paper, uh, Lawrence Peter's quote is applicable. An economist is an expert who will know tomorrow why the things he predicted yesterday didn't happen today. (laughs) Thank you for listening to and watching the Dividend Cafe. Thank you. To Brian and Dea for joining me. Uh, All three of us are excited to be doing this quite frequently with you all throughout 2022. We like these group discussions and hope they bring you uh, a fuller perspective. Uh, And of course, thanks to to our uh, communications department for putting all this together. And let's go get it in 2022. Um, Please reach out any questions anytime. Thank you for being a part of the Dividend Cafe.